Narlathota. Crawling Chaos. And the last. So, the ardent void. I don't recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger. A danger widespread and all embracing. Such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge the sense of monstrous like guilt was upon the land. And out of the abyss between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in the dark and lonely places. There was a demonic alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely. And everyone felt that the world and perhaps the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Narlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, no one could tell. But he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fella he knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of 27 centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Narlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Narlathotep and shuddered. And where Narlathotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale. Pitting moon, as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges, and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Narlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and they burned with eagerness to explore his utmost mysteries. thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesies things none but Narlathotep dared prophecy. And in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which showed only in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Narlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with restless crowds to see Narlathotep. Through the stifling night up the endless stairs into the choking room, and shadowed on a screen, I saw hooded forms amidst ruins, and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments, and I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dim and cooling sun. The sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end whilst the shadows, more grotesque than I could tell, came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about posture and static electricity, Narlathotep drove us all out, down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. 
I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid. And others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive. But when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon. For when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious and voluntary marching formations, and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to show where the tramways had run. And again, we saw a tram car, lone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was wrapped at the top, and was split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in different directions. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moon. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently I felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn. Whereas we stalked out on the dark moor, was beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows, trackless, inexplicable snows, swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf, all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin, indeed, as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green lit and snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard a reverberation of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snow drifts, quivering and afraid, into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that work can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow, writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation. Corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks, beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacuo above the spears of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums, and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable and lighted chambers beyond time. The detestable pounding and piping were unto dance slowly. Awkwardly and absurdly, the gigantic tenebrous altar gods, the blind, the voiceless, mindless gargoyles, the soulless, and all of <laughs> Thank you.